a lot of times some of you will sit there and opine in the comment section with your flaming keyboard fingers of fire about how I'm just a bitter old wrestling fan and I'm stuck in the past and I keep trying to relive the 80s and all of that. And there's probably, again, an element of truth to that. There is. You know, that's, that's just the nature of the beast. I'm going to remember those things from the past as being great. Sometimes because they were just that great. Sometimes because I'm reaching or latch, trying to latch on to something else. Maybe I remember things differently than how they actually were or how I actually remember them at the time. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And the more passage of time you get, the more you focus on the positives and you try to mask and avoid the negatives. Um, but, you know, let's be honest. From a, from a wrestling fan standpoint, from a WWF, WWE standpoint, compared to today, could you really blame me for being stuck in the 80s? Or being stuck in the Attitude Era, either one or both. Could you really blame me? I mean, let's just think about this for the second. I grew up on the Mega Powers. Kids today are growing up on the New Day. I grew up on Hulk Hogan. Kids are growing up on Roman Reigns. I grew up on Andre the Giant. Kids are growing up on Braun Strowman. I grew up on the Hart Foundation, the Rockers, the British Bulldogs. And kids are growing up on tag teams like who? Heath Slater and Rhino? American Alpha? The, the Club? The Bald Jobber Dudes? I grew up on the Macho Man Randy Savage. Kids are growing up on Dean Ambrose. I grew up on Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig, and kids are growing up on Seth Rollins. I grew up on people like Bam Bam Bigelow, and kids now are growing up with Kevin Owens. You know, I, and I think about, I grew up on dudes like JYD and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase and Jake the Snake Roberts, and kids are growing up on, now uh, you get the fucking point. I mean, just when you think about those characters and names from the past, in that era in particular that I grew up in, just think about the greatness of a lot of those names and individuals that I just brought up. And I didn't even go into the Ric Flairs and the Dusty Woes babies and the Four Horsemans. I didn't go into the World Warriors. I didn't go into Wahoo McDaniel. I didn't go into the Von Erichs and the Freebirds. And I didn't go into any of that. I kind of just did, I guess. I just think about that for a second. You know, kids today are growing up on John Cena. Are they really going to grow grow up 20, 30 years from now and remember John Cena the same way that I do a Hulk Hogan or a Macho Man, Randy Savage, or Randy Orton in that way? Absolutely not. I can't see how that's possible. It's just so striking to me. But instead of just sitting there and make this another blast piece on WWE, try to spin this in a different way and try to present some options, some uh, positive solutions, if you will, and talk about how the 80s WWF and their product could actually help today's WWE. Now, some might sit there and say, well, just because it worked 30 years ago doesn't necessarily mean it will work now. And I agree with that to a degree. You can't necessarily go 100% face versus 100% heel every single time. Uh, that's not necessarily going to work. You can't follow the old WWWF mentality of heel wins via countout, uh, then there's a DQ finish, then you get the big blow off at a big show, it's a cage match. You can't follow that format all the time. And there are things that won't work in today's world. You know, the, the patriotic type of angles can sometimes work, but they don't work as well as they did 30 years ago when you're talking about Cold War America. Um, but there are a lot of things from the product and the presentation in the 80s that I think could work incredibly well today. And if they were incorporated and utilized today, they would work just as well, and if not be a bigger positive for today's product than they were for the 80s and even into the 90s. And here's some of them. Interviews. The lost art of the interview. You used to have Mean Gene in the 80s, 
and he'd be interviewing all different types of people, heels, faces, managers, wrestlers, you name it. And it was a real, really a way to glimpse into the soul of that performer. It was another way to connect with that performer. It was another way to understand that performer. It was another way for that performer to establish themselves, another way for that performer to establish how unique they were and how different they were and what they brought to the table and what type of message or story they were trying to get across. You get so few interviews and so few quality interview makers or givers at this point in time that it's not surprising that so many of these characters kind of blend into the the masses because they're not given these opportunities. And I'd go back and I would watch like a WrestleMania 3, just throwing that show out there. But there were many others like this. You know, literally before every single match at that big show, you had a pre-taped interview, oftentimes with both the face and the heel side. So it was one last chance to really set why you should like this guy, why you shouldn't like this guy, what this story is all about. And we don't get that today. And if we did get that, it would be a way for guys to work on their comfort level in front of the camera. It would be a way for guys to hone on their craft and improve their craft and work on their craft. You know, even some of the local pre-tips, like even ROH does like the market-specific TV interviews. Imagine if WWE did that when they would be running local house shows instead of just running the generic ad of WWE's coming to town. Uh, come watch Joe Blow and Asshole and everybody else. Sit there and run a pre-taped interview with this guy that's going to be there or that guy that's going to be there and help really put a face to the name and give people a reason to connect with an individual and say, I'm going to see that person. Think about if you were doing this now at the NXT level and teaching guys how to do this. By the time they got to the main roster, they did it some more, and you do it over and over and over, and the old mentality of practice makes perfect. Well, then in three to four or five years, even if the promos are scripted, imagine how much better the guys are going to be in terms of their delivery. Look, I can tell you from doing this stuff for six years now, sometimes I can make great videos going off the cuff. Sometimes I could give you an incoherent rambling mess just because it's willy-nilly and spontaneous or I'm just going off of one idea is not necessarily mean that it's going to be any fucking good whatsoever. On the flip side, just because it's scripted or I plot it out or I have an outline of specific things I want to talk about, kind of like in this video, doesn't make it automatically bad. It could be about the delivery and the execution and the way the story is mapped out and planned out and the way I piece things together. The video can be good following that outline. Sometimes it's very helpful. But you look at these guys and you can see where that practice would really, really be helpful because when you put these guys into a position where they need to talk, they can't because they haven't learned how to and they haven't been given years of practice to be able to do so. So when I look at those old school interviews, I see just how much that's lacking in today's product and how much that would help. I look at vignettes too. Like I was watching some before I did this video. The old vignettes, if you remember, with Lord Alfred Hayes and uh, Mean Gene Okerlund, and they were looking for George Steele in the zoo, and they would do all this crazy shit. You know, you had have Macho Man Randy Savage getting interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. You would do all these different types of things. You know, not just the vignettes to introduce characters, but like the Mr. Perfect ones were awesome. You know, Superstar Billy Graham when he was coming back. You know, that was great too. But you would do these video segments, these, these vignettes that just introduced you to the characters and took you kind of into a day in the life and give you a reason, again, to either really like them or really hate them. Look up Paul Orndorff at the gym, Mr. Wonderful. There's a reason they call him Mr. Wonderful. That is magnificence. That's all I got to say. Imagine if you got some of that out of some of these guys. You know, there's an element to me that Mrs. K. Fade, now I understand you're never going to be able to go back. You can't turn the curtain back. But sometimes when guys are sitting there going out in public talking about this and that, if we're still going to try and create some type of foolish element that this is still real, and we're going to have these guys utilize their ring names, their stage names in public, then maybe they need to act a little bit more like the characters. You know, and I think about it this way. You know, when Denzel Washington does a movie, he doesn't do an interview as the character. He does the interview as Denzel Washington. But if you are sitting there and you're billing him as the name of the character from the movie, he best damn do the interview as that character. And I look at a guy like Sasha Baron Cohen as a perfect example. 
you know, even when they sit there and say Sasha Baron Cohen, you know, he comes in character and does the interview as that character. And it works for him. I look at wrestling and I say, it'd be nice to have some of those kayfabe elements. You know, like Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, I don't want to see them going out in the mass media and talking about how much they respect each other, how much they like each other. I want them to talk about how much they're going to hurt each other when the next time they face off, whether it be at the Royal Rumble or WrestleMania. You know, I don't want to hear all these shoot interviews about all this backstage bullshit, because frankly, over the past 20 years, we've heard all these goddamn stories time after time after time. We have a pretty good idea. I'd rather people be able to get o over by being characters and working within the confines of the story that they have to work with. And I think about it from a kayfabe standpoint of if somebody gets hurt in a storyline, it should be nice for them to go out in public and say, hey, I hurt my leg. I need to get around on crutches. Not, hey, this guy threw me off of a 50-foot frickin' scaffolding onto my back into flaming shards of ass glass, and then the next day I walk onto your TV set in a suit and I'm no worse for the wear. Why would anybody take your product seriously? I'd love to see kayfabe and insert pockets in certain ways, you know, be utilized like this again. You know, or you entirely go away from it. And, you know, instead of having the wrestlers use their names on Twitter, they use their actual real names. But you're not doing that. Wrestling is a little different. So as a result, they need to be a little different. And they need to be these characters more 24-7, 365. I look at commentary. And you go back to the great commentary teams of Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan, you know, even Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura had tremendous chemistry, I always thought. You know, and what you would have is you would have the clearly defined hokey babyface commentator, the clearly defined heel commentator. The heel's trying to get the heels over, the babyface is trying to get the heels and the babyfaces over. You know, when you talk about commentary now, and you watch it, it's maybe just because the people doing the commentary aren't as good, I'll grant you that's part of that. But if you had a commentator whose sole mission was to sit there and only get the baby face over, or to get the heel over as the heel, and then you had the heel commentator that was designed to only get not themselves over, but the actual heel over, imagine how much better the product would be. It would feel more like the way it should be. Sometimes you could say, well, this is the way it used to be done. That's the way it used to be done. Yeah, and sometimes the way it used to be done was done that way for a reason because that's the way it should be done. Instead, now you've got commentators. Like even when Jerry Lawler would still be working heel as a commentator or JBL is trying to work heel as a commentator, they'd be heel for this and kind of half-ass heel for that, trying to be clever and get themselves over here. But then when John Cena comes over, oh, my God, all the fucking sudden it's all about John Cena and he's awesome and he's different. No, they should be pooning John Cena in a heel way every way imaginable and putting over the heel every way fucking imaginable because it helps the heel and ultimately, ding dong, as a result, it helps John Cena too. It's just one example, but there are many of them. I also look at managers and families. You know, and people want to kiss Paul Heyman's ass and talk about how great he is as a manager. Eh, he's a great mouthpiece. I don't know if he's necessarily a great manager. You know, if he was a great manager, you could put more people with him, and he could get them over too. And I think that is something that's missing, because you do have a dedicated mouthpiece like a Paul Heyman, who's basically just sit there as a talker for Brock Lesnar. But imagine if you created a Heyman family, like you had in the Heenan family, or the Hart family. You had all these guys, interchangeable parts that you could move in and out. Oftentimes, you could start the feud with the manager. Like, a lot of times, when you go back into the 80s, for a long period of time, the feud for Hulk Hogan was not the opponent in the Heenan family. It was Bobby Heenan himself, and it just happened to be it would be Big John Studd or King Kong Bundy or Andre the Giant or Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff or whoever was associated with Heenan at the time. You could sit there and take that one manager and create two-plus years' worth of programming working with one dude. You would just change some of the pieces that were working with Hogan. You could really make a lot of money doing that. It would be a way to get help get new people over. It would be a way naturally to change characters, take somebody from a face and make them a heel. You know, and having strong, powerful heels can help your product 
And I miss those days where managers could talk for the guys that couldn't talk. Like, you know, part of the reason the Hart Foundation worked so well was Bret Hart couldn't talk worth a shit. Anvil would occasionally say some fucking weird ass shit. But it was the mouth of the South Jimmy Hart that pieced it all together. It was the mouth of the South Jimmy Hart that could talk you into being interested to how great of a tag team these guys fucking were. Sometimes you didn't need that mouthpiece. It was just icing on the cake. But you know when you watched the Road Warriors, the Legion of Doom, and then you had Precious Paul Ellering, he added another layer to that. The Four Horsemen. You didn't need J.J. Dillon in that particular case, but he most certainly didn't hurt. It was just another thing to throw on to the fire. It was another piece of the equation. But I look at the managers and the families and what you used to be able to do. Like you would have Dusty Rhodes feud with the Four Horsemen, not just because he's booking himself, mind you. But you could legitimately create one to two years worth of programming uh, for Dusty just working with the different interchangeable parts of the Four Horsemen. You could make a lot of money doing that. And I think the business could really benefit from that because, again, a lot of the guys haven't been given practice to learn how to talk, how to get themselves over in that way. It'd be nice if they had a manager or a mouthpiece that could get them over the right way. You know, I think back to the 80s and I think back to the cartoon and Tuesday Night Titans and, you know, the WWE and the market they're trying to appeal to in a lot of ways and the way their product kind of is. Instead of doing crap like an adult animated cartoons on the network, they literally should legitimately be doing a kid's cartoon. Especially because there aren't a lot of quality kid's cartoons out there today. It would be another avenue to get your guys into the mainstream. It would be another way to make stars and make the brand bigger and better by having some type of Saturday morning cartoon show. It worked in the 80s. It would work again. I refuse to believe that it would not, especially in today's environment where kids don't have a lot of these decent cartoon shows. If the WWE put out a decent cartoon show, it'd be another avenue to get more exposure. And Tuesday Night Titans, I mean, to those of you that remember the concept, it was a great concept, that talk show type of concept, another chance to get a peek into the window of characters. It's where you could introduce new characters. It's where you could set up stories. You could get faces over his faces, heels over his heels, managers over his managers, factions over his factions. You could do all these great, wonderful things. You know, a talking smack show is a kind of version of that, but it's not Tuesday Night Titans. You know, Talking Smack's on the freaking network. Tuesday Night Titans used to actually be on network TV. You know, it used to be on a cable channel. It used to be on USA. If they had a show like that, that was like that, where Talking Smack is pretty much just talking, it's not really a peak, I don't feel like, into a lot of the characters. If it had more of a Tuesday Night Titans feel, it'd probably really be helpful. And you look at the characters, too. And I... And I just say, look at the 80s, everybody was kind of unique, and they were different. They all had their own shtick, they all had their own gimmick, they all worked their own way, their own type of style to them, and now everybody's kind of the same. Now, I think a lot of that is done intentionally by the WWE due to incompetence and also with purpose. Um, but imagine if you sat there and said, Kevin Owens is going to be like this, and he is going to work like this, and he is going to talk like this, and he is going to dress and act like this, and nobody else on the roster is going to do so. Imagine if you took a Roman Reigns and you sat there and said, okay, his finishing maneuver is the spear. Nobody is to use the spear as a finisher, let alone a secondary move, see Big Show or several of the fucking women wrestlers or any of the other male wrestlers. You're just not going to do that. You know, you've got the cruiserweights. They should be doing the flips and the kicks and the high spots and work in a fast-paced style because that's what they're designed to do. That's what they can bring positively to the table. You should not have main event guys working like cruiserweights. You should not have cruiserweights working like 400-pounders. That makes no fucking sense. And in that environment, ding-dong, dumb dicks, nobody gets over but you take those characters, and then you also take those unique and interesting and different characters. That's the biggest thing, different. All shapes and sizes and looks and presentations. And you give them clearly defined roles on the card. You know, like you watch WWE now, and sometimes it's really hard to know what the main event scene on either show really looks like. You're like, well, it's the champion, and then maybe it's this guy, and then maybe it's that guy. <clears throat> but then you'll have 
this guy main events a pay-per-view, and three months later, he's not even on a pay-per-view. Or three months later, he's jobbing in the opening match of the show. That makes no sense. You Instead of building this guy up to get him there and keep him there, you thrust him into that spot without the proper buildup. Then you immediately pull the rug out from under him and collapse him and intentionally sabotage the guy. Imagine if you had a main event scene that was clearly defined, a mid-card scene that was clearly defined, an undercard that was clearly defined, and frankly, a job scene where you had certain jobbers like James Ellsworth and others who that was their primary job was to help get other talents over. It would be so beneficial. And I think back to the 80s, and I think back to the macho man Randy Savage and all of the greatness that he was. But I think of his clearly defined position on the card. You introduced him and you interjected him into the mid-card. You made him the Intercontinental Champion. What a magnificent Intercontinental Champion he was. Now, in a lot of ways, he treated the Intercontinental title like it was the biggest title. And you could get that impression from him because Randy Savage was that fucking good. But all the while, he would still get that occasional thing. And this was the genius of the Macho Man and how he, how he did it and so many others could not. It was a talent. It was a skill that few had. And that's why he was the Macho Man and other people just are pretenders. He could sit there and be talking about George the Animal stealing what he was going to do to him, or Tito Santana what he was going to do to him, or Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and what he was going to do to him, defending his Intercontinental title, yet he would still be talking about someday I want to get to Hulk Hogan and the World Heavyweight Championship. He'd be like, after I get done with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, it's going to be on to Hulk Hogan. I'm coming after you in that World Heavyweight Championship. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But you would have those clearly defined positions on the card. You would see this guy starts here, and then he goes here, and then he goes here, and he's trying to get here. There is no clearly defined movement up and down the card anymore. There's no clearly defined levels to get to. And there just isn't. And if there was, it would help everybody involved. It would bring some order to your card and to your product that is desperately needed. But imagine if you had... A Roman Reigns sitting there, and you had built him up to the point where he's the United States champion, and you have him talking about being the United States champion and how he's going to handle business against a Rusev or somebody, but he's looking ahead too and saying, when I get done with him, you better watch out, Kevin Owens, because I'm coming for your title. Instead of what they do now is they just throw the U.S. champion, Roman Reigns, against the universal champion, Kevin Owens, and it doesn't fucking work. And part of the reason to me it doesn't fucking work, among many other reasons, is the fact that you're blurring the lines. It's not this guy trying to get to this guy's level, or it's not this guy trying to hold on to his spot at this level to fight off this guy. It's this guy has this title, and because he has this title, we're jacking him up here, the old John Cena treatment. He's every bit as important, if not more so, than this guy, and that's just ridiculous. I miss those days where there was a clearly defined hierarchy in the card, a clearly defined progression up and down the card, instead of that, you know, horizontal circle jerk that we get today. You know, also the old friendship and love angles. You know, you look at Miss Elizabeth and all the business you did with Miss Elizabeth uh, with the macho man Randy Savage, George Steele, and all this, you know, Hulk Hogan later on down the road, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. I mean, you would sit there and, you know, Jake the Snake with uh, Cheryl and Rick Rude. I mean, you know, the, these love angles, they used to be done in such a way that people benefited from them. And now the WWE couldn't book a love angle to save their freaking life. And frankly, we just don't really get them. And when we do a lot of times, like with the Rusev and Alana, it's not really an angle. And we just do certain things to try and make them look stupid because apparently we don't like the fact that Rusev's boning Lana and married to her, whatever the fuck. It's ridiculous. But even the friendship angles. Like, you see this now with Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho, and it kind of works. You know, and they built them up into being best friends. But unfortunately, they do it in a way that makes Kevin Owens look fucking stupid. Yes, let's make our top champion on our A show look like an idiot because all he wants to do is keep his best friend Chris Jericho happy. That's stupid. You know, but whereas you used to have the fucking mega powers, you would have Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. Savage was gunning for him for a long time, and then all of a sudden they become friends in the mania met the madness. Ooh, yeah, brother. And then you build up that friendship, you build up that friendship, and then all of a sudden 
something happens. There's that spark, that catalyst, and these friends are no longer, and now they're bitter rivals. And man, that story comes together so naturally. And I think of a story like this, and I can't believe I'm going there, but I will go there because I really enjoyed it, as back in 2010, ROH with Kevin Steen and El Generico. El Generico and Kevin Steen are friends. People know that, said they worked together for years, and they were tag team partners and best friends and all this. And then Kevin Steen fucking turns on El Generico. And you get a whole year of programming for ROH built off of that. So you can fuck off to Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards or Roderick Strong or whoever the fuck you wanted to. But what really was interesting was Kevin Steen versus El Generico. Because... There was a natural, built-in, established friendship that everybody knew about. And then all of a sudden, when that friendship turned ugly and was no longer, you know, now you've got something. Now you've got some interest. You know, we love train wrecks as a society. So we like to see people built up just to tear them down. So we see friendships go awry. You know, sibling rivalries, all of these, these natural things that we just don't get out of the product that we used to get. It'd be great to see them again. And one last thing, just kind of throwing this out there. But in the 80s, you appealed a lot to kids and families. I know, because I grew up in that time. So I knew what they were appealing to. That's why I became a fan. Today, they're trying to appeal to kids and families. Just because they are, doesn't mean that you can't be a variety show and provide something for everybody. Now, it's not a good excuse to put on a crappy product. I'm just thinking about this. If you're trying to sit there and appeal to kids and families, one positive way to do that would be to incorporate animals into the act. Now, some old school promoters, like I think Bill Watts, will sit there and say, if people want to see animals, they can go to a circus. Well, that's why you're not in business anymore, jackass. When I think back to the 80s, and you had Jake the Snake Roberts, Roberts with Damien, you had Coco Beware with Frankie. You had the British Bulldogs with Matilda. You had Ricky the Dragon Steamboat with that big fucking Komodo dragon. I mean, it just added another layer to those characters. Now, granted, maybe they don't have to deal with PETA and other animal rights organizations like you would have to today. I grant you. But imagine if you had one performer come out with a dog. Another performer come out with a cat. One performer come out with some type of big menacing looking fucking bird or lizard or some shit like that. It's another device to potentially sell merchandise. It's another device and catalyst to potentially help get that performer over. It's another way to get those kids involved and engaged. You know, I could think back to wanting to go to house shows in the 80s and I wanted to go see freaking Damien. I wanted to go see Matilda. I wanted to go see Frankie as much as I wanted to go see Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. For those that will sit there and say you can't do that kitty hokey crap, I say bullshit. Because if it's done well, you could do whatever the fuck you want. And if we want to talk about Hulk hokey BS, it doesn't get much hokier and more BS than today's current product. So when I think about animals, I'm like... If you get the pairing right, if you get the concept right, you get the performer right, you get the story right, the animal right, it could really work, and you can make magic happen. And you could make a big star out of somebody. You know, you could. Not saying you would, but you could. So I just think back to the 80s, and I think back to all these things that they used to do. And I think about the product today, I'm like, this wouldn't be the cure-all, end-all, be-all to fix the product, but it most certainly wouldn't hurt. Would you be mad if they did more interviews and more interview type of segments, more vignettes? If we had performers actually stay in the story a little bit more? If the commentators actually did what commentators are supposed to do? If we had quality managers, just a few of them even, that actually had their own teams, their factions, their families? Would it really be that bad if WWE had its own cartoon on cable television? Would it really be bad if we had unique and different characters? Would it really be that bad if we had a clearly defined card where everybody had a role and a purpose, but you also had a clear hierarchy and where people went up and went down instead of being the horizontal circle jerk? Would 
properly done friendship and sibling rivalry and love angles be such a bad thing? Would animal acts be such a bad thing? I don't think so. I may be stuck in the past, and maybe some of these things were done in the past because that was the past, but I refuse to believe that they wouldn't work with today's product.